Good afternoon, everyone. Six o'clock, so we can go ahead and start. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and mount in. I guess Moss. So we're on chapter three. Chapter three is the four basic principles to unify mind and body. Shin Shin Tuitsuno Yongai Gen Soku. And let me just read a paragraph from this chapter. The mind and body may not be artificially separated. The mind is without shape, form, or physical restriction and can be used freely and powerfully simply by shifting our attention. The body is controlled by physical laws that limit its strength and development. However, a living body is more than a mere physical object. A body that is infused with a calm mind is a body that can respond to key. Strong key can move through a mind and body, which is calm and relaxed. So, you know, Curtis and they did the four principles in great detail. Um, so I'd recommend listening to or reading those. You can either listen to it on YouTube or read the transcripts, which he sends out. So I'm going to do it a little different. So I figure what we'll do is we'll start off with, you know, mind-body unification. How did you learn mind-body unification? You know, what was your aha moment? And also, what, what do you do to reset yourself in mind-body unification? So, you know, uh, the, ch the little chapter I just read um, talked about being calm and that key can flow through your body strongly when you're relaxed and centered. So, you know, we'll just, not many of us here tonight, so we'll just go around the room and discuss it and have a chat about it. And um, if you're a teacher, I might ask you how you teach it. So, Byron, you're here for, I haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? How do you, you know, what was your aha moment with mind-body unification and uh, how do you teach mind-body unification to students? Um, my aha moment was, um, I met Tabata Sensei in 91 at Leeward Community College. So I um, decided to take a class from him and we were doing the basic standing with mind and body connection. And it was pretty um, interesting because you, would, you know you would stand and get tested. You wouldn't know why you feel uncoordinated. And then uh, when he told me to keep one point, and then he tested me, I was like, "Wow, how is he doing that? You know, I'm stable, and my mind and body is just it just feels real stable and not uncoordinated." So that was my aha moment to start learning about um, Shin Shin Tuitsu Kirakiro. And then um, for me to teach it, I think the easiest way is the basic standing with mind and body you know, uh, coordinated. Um, when I teach the students, um, I find that that's the easiest way to show them that an uncoordinated um, Person and then a coordinated person. And then when you tell them to keep that certain point, then it gives them a, um, an idea of what it feels like. And then from there, I notice it um, gets them thinking about more, being more interested in learning what mind and body um, unification is. And that's that's what I do, you know, to teach it. I find it's the easiest. And then um, I try and relate it to uh, everyday life and things that you do, um, certain positions or um, maybe playing a sport that like maybe I'm familiar with. And then um, I'll show the person like golf. Uh, you have to have your whole mind and body coordinated for 
your swing and ball to go what you want it to. So I was showing a couple people one time and then I told them, okay, you know, try and hit the ball and then tell me how it feels. And then um, I just told them to keep in that one, one area. And then I told them to hit the ball again and, told, and then I asked them, how did it feel? So they gave me, um, they responded in saying they felt more balanced and coordinated. But um, for me, that's the easiest way to keep um, a short person keeping one point. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's uh, similar. I mean, when I teach the introductory classes, we always do posture first, you know, sit tall, stand tall, walk tall. And uh, usually that's where we start explaining you know, how to keep one point uh, and how to be mind and body unified. I also relate it to when you're talking to someone and everyone's done this where they say something, oops, I shouldn't have said it that way or I should have said it differently. Hence, your brain was working, you know, but not fast enough for your mouth <laughs> to be talking, you know, and you may say, slip up things that you don't mean to say. Or, you know, I've, you know, had the crow fly in my mouth a few times. And, uh, you know, I think, oh, gosh, I wasn't, I was reacting versus being centered and responding. I wasn't listening. I was thinking about, usually I'm thinking about how to solve the problem that they got. You know, that was my big, big thing that I always thought I could do by, you know, practicing Aikido, I could really help people and fix all their problems. But uh, obviously, that is mistaken. So Fincher, what was your aha moment on mind body unification? And, and how do you teach it? Hello, Sensei and everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I don't think I've had an aha moment. It's, it's a gradual I'm sort of a process person. Um, I, I go step by step with process and, and uh, that's sort of the way it, it happens with me. Gradually, you know, a little bit more understanding, a little bit more understanding and with training. Um, and again, it's just a little bit more understanding. I don't think I have it down completely. It's just more and more as I as I pursue it, you just have a, a deeper understanding, more experience with what it isn't, and uh, more experience of what it is. So uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I can't give you a big aha moment. Well, tell um, me, like when you started Aikido, though, um, you started in a beginner class, right? Up country yeah. or down? Yeah. yeah. Started in a beginner class. and. Well, no, I didn't come to a, a, a four week class. I just started. Oh, yeah. I just I just came to class and started. Ah, yes, they threw you in the deep water. I just started with Chuck. Yeah, I came in, watched one night and then joined. And then when did you first get exposed to mind body unification? Well, you know, beginners class, it starts right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's um, I just think, you know, even, even now when uh, Curtis Sensei tests you and let's say you're not quite stable enough and he adjusts you and uh, I think the, uh, the influence of a teacher um, giving you confidence to be stable I think, I mean, if, if that's, that's something I really uh, have experienced. And I guess, yeah, if you wanted to say, well, what, what, what has really given you a clue? Um, I'd say that that was it. You know, when, when the, the, the sensei um, comes and tests you and then adjusts you and gives you a little hint and then tests you again, I think all the way up through the training, that's been a fascinating phenomenon, you know, and shows you, oh, well, I'm, I'm more stable and I haven't done anything. 
I'm not being more stable, I just am more stable. I think that's sort of uh, the characteristic of mind-body uh, unification that has always been kind of fascinating. That it's not something you actually do. It's a result of basically not doing something. It's a, the, the uh, experience of it being a natural um, quality that with a change of the mind just rests there with you. So if that, that's close enough to an aha moment, maybe, I don't know. Um, and uh, the way I teach it is, is sort of the same way. It, it's more or less, you know, we talk about the basics and then I try to refer it to something in a person's day because everybody experiences it in something that they do. Uh, if they do it well, like if you're a carpenter, you're, you're you know, uh, you're probably uh, mind-body coordinated sometime during your life. Um, if you're a nurse, if you're anything, it's, and, and so I try to relate that to when you feel really stable in what you're doing in your daily life. You know, if you're going to a grocery store and you have your list and it just pops right off, well, you know, that's probably mind-body coordination. And then, then to, to go to how I've experienced it, you know, testing, um, adjusting, relaxing, and then testing again, and um, relating it to to a natural state, not something you have to learn to do, even though you kind of do, but it, you're experiencing it in your life already. You just have to be aware of that and working on that, you know, the natural state of mind-body unification. Yeah, I like, uh, yeah, relating to that. I remember when uh, David Heva Heva was telling, we were talking one time about his experience with weight underside and he said that you know when i first he was a carpenter when i first started swinging on the hammer i was all upper and i would always get so sore i would always be sore you know i'd go home and my body would be sore my arm and shoulder would be sore but then when he first realized you know he started hitting a hammer and it was easy for him again and then he goes i was actually experiencing my body unification and i didn't even know it at the time yeah. you know where he was Box and swinging that hammer and it just came naturally to him, you know, where he watched the new guys come in and they're like, you know, and they can't, they can't do it very well because they're all coming from their upper side. But yeah, I, I like that relating it to something that people can relate to because, you know, people learn differently and you get some of the students and they're all up here in their head and then you get other students and they're all about the body, you know, so you got to you got to get them to merge both their mind and body together, for sure. So Phoenix, you were here early today, checked in early. What was your aha moment for mind-body unification? And I had one before I started, which was my daughter was in the class, Jen and uh, Grace and Sarah went to school together and they were in, I think, the first grade. Um, and so I brought Sarah, brought Grace and after a few weeks of training, we went to the mainland and it was the 4th of July and in the neighborhood where we were, they're were blowing up like big scale fireworks right in, right in the middle of the street. My daughter loves fireworks, but she was terrified. She would scream when the bomb went off, when the noise went off. And I, I just looked at her and said, keep, keep one point. She sat down, says up, and she was fine and laughing and just like, it was so amazing and so quick. It's like, oh, I want some of that. <laughs> and then one other, certainly always working with the instructor is hugely helpful. But a few years in, not always since I was teaching a class, and the exercise was for the nage to stand in the middle of, to stand in the middle of the mat and just extend their hand. And the idea was like you're gonna brush this person's hair as they go by but connect with them as they walk across the mat. And it was Eric Hua, and um, 
And he came and he was coming with some speed. And I just did just that. And he just went whoosh, like, you know, like down, you know, just down on the mat. And I could feel it. It was such a, I just, I was dumbfounded for days. <laughs> just, and it wasn't, we didn't do it again, anything. It was just this moment like, oh, this is what, this is what is here. It's, so, it, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I can relate to having those moments when I was, you know, starting out and a very beginner, and not being really super uncoordinated on the mat, and then, you know, having the instructor tell me, you know, move from your one point, you know, relax, you know, all the things that they say, and then finally being able to do it for the first time, you're like, how'd that happen? Wow. You know, that was amazing. <laughs> yeah, it still kind of, a, it kind of comes and goes with me, that's for sure. <laughs> but, yes. Yeah, that's our primary practice. And, you know, there's levels and levels of it, you know, just like anything else. You know, that's why they have key tests, you know, show QT tests, you know, you're touching the person first so they feel comfortable with somebody touching, then you test, you know. And then as it goes up, you know, show Q, 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 and then into the den levels, it just gets more subtle and more relaxed. Mm -hmm. And that allows you, you know, with the support of your teacher, because that's what really, you know, we tend to be confused about key testing and, and it's not you against a student, it's you supporting the student so that way they can have that experience. They can have that moment of, oh yes, this is what it's all about, type deal. So thanks, Phoenix. Thank you. So, Kayomi, how are you tonight? Thank you, Sensei. I'm doing well. And hi, everybody. Um, I I don't think I have really aha moment either. Um, usually, when Naruai Sensei um, tests me. Uh, first one, I always fail. I just, <laughs> I just can't do it. And then he helped, helps me a little bit, then uh, maybe second or third time. And I'm able to unify mind and body. Then he said, oh, this is good. Uh, so I have just this brief moment of experience. Uh, in Tai Chi class, I have, uh, because I'm doing this longer, uh, from the what helped me to realize this coordination was uh, I uh, teacher told me I forgot Naluai Sensei or Tai Chi teacher but I think it's the same message. There's a difference between dead relaxation and uh, maintain proper form and uh, relax in there. And uh, that one actually I could I could see the difference. And uh, in Tai Chi, uh, first, I think I was moving my hand and legs and stuff like that. And then eventually, I learned to move from the uh, Tanden, I think, which is one point for the uh, Aikido. And when I move from it, it just body just comes with my movement. And uh, one time I, I had a, my uh, more experienced person right next to me and Colette and I were doing it together and I just felt that it was just so synchronizing it's not only me but I was synchronized but also the Colette and I are just moving together and we I think both of us felt so good until someone just breathed heavily then suddenly I, I, I just got distracted the same time she did too. And I think until that happens, uh, I, I feel that both of us are very uh, one together, not only within us, but also together with her. So that was the experience. And I'm not sure how to teach this to, to, <laughs> to other people. I, I think I would say move from one point and move from Tanden or totally focus on, like when I teach, uh, I'm just focused on how to deliver it and just really watching that the students 
if they're absorbing it. And then I don't worry about how I look or if I make a mistake, I'm just totally focused. And then I think that's what I think Karthi Sensei said, uh, keys out, not they're looking into me, but I'm just, I think that's when I think I, I'm probably extending key. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's a an interesting phenomenon when you are you are with somebody else who's who's keeping one point, who's helping you, assisting you in some way. It could be the teacher. It could be another student. Uh, it could be you know somebody at home. You know that. And, and it's not limited to just Aikido. I mean, there you you can see people who are absolutely mind body unified. They're just not calling it that, and they've maybe done something over and over again, and where they're totally just free of any other thing than doing what they're doing. And and yeah, that's mind body unified unification as well. And, and we're just that's kind of our primary practice here is we're you know mind body unification is something that Toy Sensei really got, you know, from Tempu Nakamura and, and, and that style of, you know, mind leads body was his primary teaching. Uh, and he passed that on to Toy Sensei. And Toy Sensei really took the ball and ran with it and really just developed a whole practice around that, you know, mind leads body phrase that he received from Tempu Nakamura. You know, it's, it was something that, that he basically didn't invent. He just kind of was showed it and then just said, wait a minute, this is incredible and made an entire practice out of it. So it's, it's something that, you know, anyone can do, you know, it's not limited to, to, you know, any, any, it has no limitations in a sense. It's you as a person being being connected uh, together. So Linda Sasaki Sensei, you uh, got the vibe here where I asked, uh, we're on chapter three, which is the four basic principles. And we are, I'm asking, what was your aha moment for mind-body unification? And how do you teach mind-body unification to someone? Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I kind of like with Fincher. I don't think I had a totally aha moment with the, you know, the principles of mind and body unification. It was just something that um, we practice all the time. You know, um, it's, you, you know, sometimes it worked and you wonder, okay, so how did I do that? And after a while, I think um because you're processing it and then applying it to aikido and the other things that you do in your life then it becomes a gradual aha moon you know kind of moment but it's a long moment that you realize man this thing really works <laughs> you know and it's just not to aikido it's it's everything and um, as far as the students are concerned, you know, I, I guess I take an Asian point of view where um, you just constantly grill them and show them. And then we make them games so that it's fun for them, you know, because the kids are still, particularly kids, it's like, oh, but I don't get it. <laughs> you know, and I can relate to that, you know, so we, we we will make games um, sometimes as Aikido rolling and whatnot, and their ability to do certain things. Weight on their side is always great for them. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I could say I had a, a, a total one aha moment. You know, the only time I had an aha moment was when, you know, I, I tend to be a klutz and I trip. And I mean, I will go head first because I'm walking in a splash clip. And I guess because of Aikido and I didn't panic, I just rolled out. 
you know, no matter how close I came to that pavement, I, I always managed to, to, you know, not panic and roll out. And you can ask um, Roy, because I really embarrassed myself crossing the street, trying to get to Tokyo Station. <laughs> and we were really, you know, going a fast clip and I tripped and went head first and I knew I couldn't save myself, but I managed to side roll out. And I stood up and I thought, did anybody see? And of course, everybody saw that was waiting for the light to turn green. You know? <laughs> but oh, wow. you know, it's stuff like that, that you, you really realize, my God, you know, this kind of stuff really works. You know, not only does it save yourself a lot of grief and physical harm, but um, you can take the stress in the jobs too. You can relate to people in a better way. I don't disagree with that at all. It really helps you connect. When your mind body unified connection is something that just comes naturally. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be uh, something you do. Uh, it just manifests, it just comes out of it, being mind body unified. Yeah, I really like, uh, you know, a lot of people don't have an aha moment, so to speak, or if they did, they um, don't remember it sometimes. And, you know, my <laughs> moment probably with Kurtis Sensei at the, uh, at the uh, Hongwonji Dojo, when I visited here, and of course I've been training a long time, but you know, and of course I thought I really knew what one point was and my body implication, but he explained it, you know, by basically calling me up and testing me and showing me over and over again. And yeah, I was like, okay, that was what, uh, that's what that, is. okay. I kind of got a feeling of it now more so than I ever had before, but then counter that with the one time I was taking my Shodan test in Seattle with Shinichi Sensei, and it was the first time Shinichi Sensei had been teaching a seminar on the mainland. He had, I think he had, he'd either come to the mainland first and then gone to Hawaii or vice versa. I don't know which way he went, but he was in Seattle. I was, I had asked Curtis Sensei to be as a tall because he had nobody else with him from Hawaii. and. Of course, I'm preparing for my Shodan test. I'm super nervous. And right up to that, he was like, no, no, no. And he was just pushing me over left and right, left and right to where I got to be. Oh my God, I'm not going to pass this test. I was just in panic in a sense. So I kind of went over to Shaner Sensei and I said, Shaner Sensei, uh, bowed in with him. Can you, can you test me? I'm taking my Shodan test. And she was gonna say, of course, then just pass, pass, pass. Oh, you're fine, you're fine. And I said, wow, how is it that I can pass your test, <laughs> but I can't pass Curtis Sensei's test? And I think it's because I had this, I hadn't accepted it fully with Curtis Sensei and I was not letting myself pass the test in some weird way. And that was like a moment that I had there. And then later on in the seminar, after kind of talking to a few people that were going to the seminar, telling them about my experience with Curtis and saying Shane and say, that I finally was able to go, you know, it doesn't matter who's testing you. Just keep one point. Just, you know, just practice the four principles and you'll be fine. And that was, that was to me like my moment of, oh yeah, it really doesn't matter who's testing you, just never mind, you know? Don't make a big deal out of it. John, how are you doing? Do you have an aha moment? Hi, Sensei, hi everyone. Um, I have a different kind of aha moment. I mean, cause like I've never experienced a mind and body coordinated moment with Aikido in a way. I mean, I've had mind and body coordinated uh, experiences, but I, I don't know if I've ever experienced um, mind and body coordinated 
with Aikido. Does that make sense? Um, but anyways, yes. yeah, the different aha moment um, was like when learning about um, extending key with your fingertips, like unbendable arm. And I felt like that was like blew my mind away and made me like completely um, go, wow, this Aikido stuff is really, really cool because <laughs> of unbendable arm. And I think wow. one more one more moment with um, Aikido was um, uh, when I was chanting, like I'm a Buddhist minister at the Jodo Mission and I chant and I realized um, when I'm extending my voice, I'm extending key. And when I'm extending key, I'm connecting with other people. And it just was kind of like this, like, whoa, I didn't realize that, you know, I'm connecting pe with people through my voice with key. I just didn't know the words for it. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I felt like that was a aha moment, but not necessarily mind and body coordinated. Yeah, that, well, I think it is in a sense, you know, um, Oh, sensei used to talk about Kotodama, which is he used to do chanting and require all the students to do these chants uh, to, to, you know, he didn't call it mind body education, but of course he was. And he, you know, he, he through his religious practice, which, you know, was a moto, uh, or Moto Kyo, chanting was a big deal for him. So, you know, he used to chant every morning, of course. And, you know, when you learn Japanese, they have the the way you pronounce the the syllables, like ka, ku, ki, ke, ko, you know. And, and Toy Sensei tells a story about O Sensei telling him to reverse it in some way. And if it if they didn't do it this way, it would be really bad juju or whatever. And Toy Sensei, you know, he was superstitious. Oh, Sensei was very superstitious. And, you know, that kind of Toy Sensei kind of took the superstition out of mind body unification, you know, it, because back in the day, you know, they had strange ways of experience, you know, explaining things, you know, because it, it, they just do on how you, you see how, you know, science you know, erode certain values people have because scientifically they find out exactly what's going on when before it was, you know, the gods did this or, you know, this happened this way or that way. And, and you know, Toy Sensei was, was really good at taking the mystery or the, you know, the fantasy out of Aikido, which I think is remarkable, you know, because a lot of a lot of people don't, they still believe that hocus pocus type stuff when really it's just mind body unification folks, you know? Well, let's see, who do we got left? Oh, Murta, how are you tonight? I see you there. Good evening, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> A little bit more yes. sound. Yeah. We, we can, we can. yeah. Um, I struggled for a long time um, finding mind-body unification. I was very tense. Um, and when I started Aikido, I really wasn't so happy. Um, but somehow that was lucky too, because there was a moment when I really felt like, okay, um, if I'm not happy, I better just let it go, whatever it is. So it, it kind of I was kind of forced by, by my um, unhappiness to let go of myself. Um, and I thought because I didn't care, but it gave some kind of release. And then I came to the dojo and things were so different. Um, I had all this energy and um, I was able not to think about the techniques that I Fortunately, I practiced a lot and I wasn't even aware of what I was doing or um, it was it, ju it was just happening. And somehow I had time, whereas I never have time to do anything. It's, I'm always late. But then 
for a while I was very much on time and I, I, I dealt with all my partners and uh, I was even doing simple kind of randori. And I thought, oh my God, but it wasn't me. <laughs> Who was doing this? So, and then as a result of my training, perhaps I became happier and more satisfied. And then I started losing it. And now I'm in the process of letting go because I want to and not because I'm forced to. So I start realizing, okay, you're, uh, you're, you're working against yourself. So why would you make yourself unhappy by resisting all the time? Be happy and also let go. So that's my experience. Yeah. So, okay, it's possible for me. I just have to get out of my own way. Yeah, isn't that the truth? That's a, that's a problem that we all have. We tend to get in our own way more than more than uh, more than we think we do. A lot of times, sometimes we we're in our own way and we don't even know it. So you know, like Curtis and I always like to say, just notice. You know, be aware. You know, noticing is super important. And when you do notice, you think, "Oh yeah, I've been doing that. I didn't realize that." You know. Because we tend to, you know, our minds are, are very, very tricky in a sense because they have to live with, we have to live with ourselves. So we tend to, you know, do a lot of strange things to be able to live with ourselves. And when your mind body unified, it's, you're free in a sense, you're free of that path to be you know, unhappy to be just, you know, feel bad about yourself and how things are, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very freeing experience, I think. I think a lot of people have come across that, that feeling that mind-body unification has really allowed them to let go in a sense, to be open and vulnerable, where before they were very guarded and not so open, very closed. Uh, so yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing. That's that's uh, that's really good. I'm glad you've had that experience. Um, let's see. We have some people who don't have video. I know Lucky and Jack and Charlotte. Anything? Speak up. If you have a question. Or a hello, Sensei. Oh, hello. Hey, I was just um. Min I was just thinking about one time. Well, so to start, I don't think I've ever really had an, an aha moment. You know, it's all, I've always, um, minded body coordination has always been like some, especially from the beginning, it was like just some superpower sense they had, you know, it was like something, Oh, if I stand right and I, you know, keep one point, then I'll be able to do it, you know, but then as I, you know, trained more and more, I got, I kind of got the feeling, but I never really, you know, saw the effects. And what, what Sensei always told me was that, um, you know, Sensei Paiva always told me is that the, the first thing you really start seeing is like, if you, if you fall or if you're, you're, you know, you have the tendency to be clumsy, um, you'll catch yourself just because you're, you're more aware and in the moment. And there's one, one time when I really, I, I believe I would have hurt myself badly if not for Aikido. I was moving really, really quickly on pavement and I tripped. And instead of just, you know, sprawling out and skinning my face on the pavement, I rolled. And I actually, I had so much momentum, I actually rolled twice. But I walked away completely fine other than, you know, some scrapes on my back. And that was the, the first, I, I, I can't call it an aha moment, but it was the first time that I really went like, Wow, I you know my training has had a profound impact on my daily life. Yeah, I've I've had uh, I've fallen a few times, slipped. I've slipped a few times where I've slipped like this, and it's my break fall training that saved my head. You know, not crashing my head on the pavement, and that's happened to me a couple times when it's been super slippery, like you can't see water or you know both times it's been with water that you couldn't see and i had real slippery shoes on and down i went but i wasn't hurt you know that was the thing i've had that happen too so that's really good 
So anyone else, Charlotte? No problem. Hello, Sensei. I, I think okay. I have a little bit. Uh, okay. I, I too have not had an aha moment as of yet. Um, and I, I guess I haven't experienced uh, mind and body unification enough to, de uh, to describe it well, I think. That I, I probably feel it a lot without being aware of it when like I know what to do exactly when to do it like uh, my entire my mind and body is coordinated but i think a lot of those times i'm not aware of it and so i i, I guess i'm not quite sure how to describe it yeah that's fine i mean you know as we progress you know like i said there's levels and levels of of mind body unification and you know that's something you know you have to work on you know not you know if you have to experience it you know you have to be able to do it and then the then the third thing is you got to be able to explain it and that's you know when you start becoming an instructor you know at you know probably sound down or so that's when you really have to pay attention to how do I express this to others you know because you know right when you're going through the q ranks you're really struggling to you know experience it sometimes and when you do you can't replicate it a lot of times and you're looking for consistency and you're looking for you know as shinichi sensei says for your one point to come down a little lower because it always you're always like coming up and going down coming up and going down and and you know then when you get to shodan you're you can actually have some consistency with it and then that's when you really have to start uh you know learning how to transmit that that teaching to others so yeah that's good charlotte i see you you're here how about with you <laughs> yes, I'm here. <laughs> I, at, least, I, at least I try to be here. <laughs> I couldn't keep away. <laughs> oh, it was hard this morning to get up. <laughs> I admit. <laughs> okay, so uh, just listening to the others, lots of stories came to my mind, but maybe you can call it a hard moment, but I wouldn't do, do like that. It just feels, yes, sometimes. So um, one one experience that came up was uh, a bit. I was uh, waiting uh, for a train to come to go to the dojo. It was already uh, late in the evening, so um, just to to stay there and so quite quite late and um, three uh, young gay guys came and uh, I saw they are not German origin so origin more from from the east but they looked fine it was just, just normal and I noticed they they just wanted to to provoke me and uh, where do you come from? Oh, you're German, they asked. I said, oh, you speak very well, so you have grown up here. And uh, after time, it went on like that, and I, I just didn't allow them to, to enter to provoke me. And then after a time, even one of them took out a knife. And uh, the other one said, ah, oh, he's not allowed to keep that knife. And another one, uh, what they did at a store, at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a restaurant with, with a girl to, to frighten her, and that she was really frightened. And the other, oh, but it's not astonishing because you told her you, you want to kill her. And they just couldn't enter. I don't know what happened, but somehow it seems I, I really had one point at that moment. And they just couldn't provoke me. And he scrapped his 
his face with a knife, his beard, and stood there, and I just didn't react. I just keep calm. So that is one story. And the end was the train came. I just told that the big that was the biggest who with a knife, the biggest of the three. He, he told me before he would like to go to the east to shoot, and I told him, you're telling so stupid stories. You can shoot at the internet, at, because nobody's shooting back, so you can play there. But, and when, when the train came, just short after, um, that um, I thought it would go on in the train. But the, the three guys were running to the other end of the train to enter there. I said, what is happening now? <laughs> it felt like they were, the, as if they were running for me. <laughs> it was strange. I only real, realized after, afterwards that it was a really special situation. So I don't know. Normally it feels like I'm always losing one point. I, I lose it so easily. <laughs> But maybe during the years, something changed, something happened. When I came, I was very much in uh, judo mode still, just liking to fight, to play. It was more a play. I, I didn't really fight in judo. We had, uh, I liked it very much. We had a rule that 30% uh, of your power belongs to your partner. And the rest is for you to win. But 30 percent is for him and that i liked very much so it was not real fight it was more play and it was was very good in that in that where i learned judo but when i came to aikido i was much in that but now i i really is may, maybe you I, it's not a harm a moment at a point but maybe something changed <laughs> yeah, nice. That's a good story. Uh, uh, <laughs> when uh, Lynn Curtis told a story to Curtis Sensei, and Curtis Sensei restated the story to me, and she was at, a, she's a, Lynn Curtis Sensei is a big time surfer. She goes surfing every morning, and she surfs at Hokipa, and it's a very local, you know, area. And she was there, and these local boys were, I guess, in the midst of starting a fight with a, with a, with a kid there. They were going to fight. And Lynn just walked up to them. She didn't do anything. She just kept one point. Mind and body unified, and just looked at the guy who was starting the, the crap, and dissolved the situation. In a sense, they just turned and walked away. You know, when they were set on fighting with this other kid, who obviously would have probably gotten beaten very badly, <laughs> because he wasn't up to fighting, and she just dissolved the situation. And she, you know, she, I think she reiterated Curtis and say that she didn't know what came over. Her. She just walked into the situation and looked at the kid like, really? Really? You know, the way only Lynn Curtis could do. And and it dissolved the situation. And, and Curtis and say was like, holy smokes, when she told me that, I was a bit worried that she couldn't, you know, get something she couldn't handle, but she handled it very well. And, you know, that's that's the that's the thing, you know, what we're 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 looking at and, and practicing and, you know, unifying mind and body is something, you know, in a heated situation can serve you well, but just in your day to day life, it can serve you so well, just practicing and resetting, you know, we tend to, you know, lose one point, of course, I lose one point, everyone loses one point, or loses their mind body unification, as we say, and, but it's noticing, ah, and come back, you know, you get off center, you reset. 
get off center, you reset. And that's what this is all about. That's why we call it practice. You know, it's not called perfection. <laughs> it's practice. So does anybody have anything else they'd like to add? If not, I have a little something to read to close the class. Oh, Kayomi, raising your hand physically. Okay, I have a question. Um, uh, oh, yeah, sure. Just listening to everybody's story, and I think it was Lucky said he wasn't sure it would, if he had a, a, a body and mind unified or not. And when we have body and mind unified, it more, sounds like we don't know. I think as soon as we, we say, hey, I have this mind and body coordination, I think it's already, it is already disturbed to me. I mean, I understand that if we lose it, we come back. We need to be aware of it. But then, you know, like a Charlotte situation where someone almost to fall and, and save, I think that's almost like, because you're so with the moment, you don't even think about it because when you think about it it's already, it's a thought. So to me, I, I feel it's more natural that maybe um, you are so focused either you know emergency situation or I, feeling good you know i just felt the tai chi just i felt the flow just felt mm -hmm. good i wasn't sure what it was but just felt good i feel the same way for yoga too feeling good and so i i wonder if we are supposed to know that we are quite like a unified that's my question. Well, I don't think it's about knowing or not knowing in a sense of what you're saying. I think that, of course, yeah, a lot of times when you're like, if you're separating from yourself and looking at yourself, yes, then you're, then you're not mind and body unifying because you've separated and you're looking at yourself. Um, that's a common mishap for beginners, I think. And even for advanced people, it can happen, but that's, true when you're in a flow state you're normally mind body unified and it's no different than us having a conversation and connecting where we're completely you know unified and in a sense you know um we're in the moment we're not thinking of the future we're not dwelling on the past but we're in the moment and when we're in the moment that is a time when mind body unification is very easy it comes it just it's subconscious it just comes about subconsciously it's a subconscious thing you know it's not a conscious thinking body thing it's subconscious and that's why we do breathing and meditation to train our subconscious you know when we do that training over and over again reset come back reset come back we're just doing mind body unification training that's really all that is hope that helps Okay, so there is a word in Persian. It's called subat. And literally, it means the art of conversation and companionship. But the deeper meaning is connection. Two persons have toiled in vain and labored without benefit. One is he who has saved and not consumed. And the other is he who has learned and not acted. No matter how much learning you acquire, if you don't act, you're ignorant. What knowledge or awareness do those empty headed people have? Are they carrying kindling or notebooks? For certain things to come into being, they have to be enacted in the world. Here, for learning truly exists, you need to act according to it to show it in the appropriate way. Otherwise, you are in fact ignorant and you are learning in vain. Learning does not exist separately from its expression. And I read that and I kind of I kinda paraphrased it here and it, it is experiential. When your mind body unified, it is, it's an experiential thing. You can't think about it in such a way because you're going to be outside of it. You just have to subconsciously know how to, re how to know what it is and how to reset when you're not in it. So, you know, I think we'll call it a night.
It's been a good class. Thank you all very much. Domo arigato gozaimashita. And we'll see you next week. Have a good evening and a good morning.